Hello, everyone, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thank you for joining us on this August afternoon. My name is Rhea Stark. I'm the Digital Engagement Manager here at TLC, and this is our first webinar back this summer. We took a little break following ALA, and we are glad to be back and glad to kick off a back to school series. So as our schools are getting ready for the new year, we imagine that there are quite a bit of new books and materials to add to the catalog. So today we're going to be focused on catalog. Cataloging. Now, for those of you who are longtime listeners, you know that I am not a cataloger. <laughs> In fact, I joke with the team often that sometimes it's like a foreign language to me. But luckily, you are all going to be in good hands because I have invited some experts from our product team um, who can speak more to it than I will be able to. On your screen, you should see Sam Bernizer, our Director of Product Management. And joining him is our legendary Kim Mumbauer, who is a product manager and longtime cataloger. So you will be in good hands for today's topic. And in fact, if you are anything like me and the thought of cataloging makes you want to run back to library school, don't worry, you're in the right place because our panelists are going to show you how to save time and feel confident using a natural language editor. So we have a lot of great content. We may end up going the full hour today. We usually time them about 30 minutes, but I think this one's gonna be pretty good. There's lots of stuff to show, so stay tuned for the hour. Uh, before I pass over the microphone, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over. We are live this Wednesday afternoon. Um, as you notice, I'm stumbling over my words. This is not rehearsed. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but those of you joining us live do have the opportunity to ask questions. So at any point during the webinar, if you have something you'd like to ask, please add that into that questions panel and we'll get to it at the end of the session. And if you would like to share this webinar with any of your colleagues, or if you want to catch the replay, uh, this is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on our, web star on our website at tlcdelivers.com slash webinars. And finally, before you log out today, please go ahead and uh, download those handouts and brochures. We've got a lot of great information to expand on today's topic, so be sure to get those before you log out. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sam Bernizer to get us started. Sam, thank you so much for joining us for Back to School with Webinar Wednesday. Well, good morning and good afternoon to wherever you are. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to start out with talking about, as Rhea noted, I'm going to give an overview of LS2 cataloging. And I want to note that LS2 cataloging is part of a bigger set of solutions that's within our library.solution for schools integrated library system. It is a web-based product made up of, of a suite of tools that enable the te busy teacher librarian to quickly and efficiently make resources available to all students, teachers, and or staff. Here at TLC, we believe data is the, is the fuel that powers library.solution for schools ILS. But that's not just true of library.solution for schools, it's true of any ILS. Furthermore, it's the quality of the data. It's the ability to manipulate the data and the solutions that automatically maintain the data that ultimately impact the teacher librarian's workload and all catalog users. While having a solution that empowers teacher, li teacher librarians to do, to do their job is critical, it's also equally important for the students and staff to be able to search and discover, discover library resources. We believe the ILS should provide a suite of solutions that maximize search and discovery for all its users. LS2 cataloging is a window into the ILS data via a natural language editor. That is, LS2 cataloging users do not need to know a data standard in order to edit or update the metadata. The LS2 cataloging editor, while conforming to a data standard mark, does not require you, the user, to keep up with that data standard as it changes. LS2 cataloging is a suite of solutions that maximize the amount of time and effort needed to maintain, minimizes the amount of time and effort needed to maintain data accuracy. That is, LS2 cataloging offers behind the scenes solutions in which data is checked for conformity to data standards and checked for specific enrichments. When finding such opportunities, the system automatically modifies the record without requiring staff intervention. 
These processes are all incorporated into the solution to decrease the work needed to maintain the catalog and to provide that optimized search and discovery experience. LS2 cataloging is a bridge to the next data standard. We call it future ready. That is the streamlined solution provides teacher librarians with the tools they need to maintain their data without having to monitor that ongoing data standard and plan for upcoming transitions to a new data standard. In other words, the LS2 cataloging experience is, is about providing you tools to maintain your cataloging without having to monitor all the future data standards. What are some of the LS2 cataloging tools? Let's look at that next. With all the demands of the busy teacher librarian, a catalog, cataloging can be stated as a means to an end. That is, we believe that cataloging is not about conformity to the specific data standard in use at the time, but a way to empower users, be it a student, be it a teacher, be it a school staff member, to search and discover those library resources that meet their learning or entertainment needs. LS2 Cataloging offers that suite of tools to streamline the work of the teacher librarian. Knowing that there is a diversity of metadata providers resulting in all different levels of cataloging quality within a school's cataloging catalog, LS2 Cataloging provides automated tools that improve records to support search and discovery. Within the application, there are automated enrichments to add RDA fields to the records. There are supporting services that add reading program data. And there are tools that upgrade minimal records to full level records with authorized subject headings and authors in order to ensure that your school library resources are find, being found by your students and staff. Realizing that metadata needs to be maintained in order to be accurate and relevant, LS2 Cataloging offers a series of solutions to correct common data standard structural issues. Actually, there are tools that automatically up to, up, update the authorized headings to keep the data rich and accurate. There are also batch edit tools that enable the teacher librarian to quickly update a large number of records whenever the need arises. LS2 Cataloging also provides access to glossaries and authority databases, which streamline the data entry process. These tools also ensure data consistency, resulting in a better, better search and discovery experience. LS2 Cataloging offers a suite of tools that provides the teacher librarian a set of streamlined solutions to quickly add resources to the catalog to maintain the catalog so you, the teacher librarian, can focus on the school's instructional program instead of routine catalog maintenance. If the need arises to do original cataloging, there's also direct integration to TLC's ITSMARC data services that make original cataloging streamlined and efficient so you, again, can focus on your instructional program. Some of the features that we want to discuss today, I'm going to highlight before I turn it over to Rhea and Kim. First, there's the ability to import those vendor records. Rhea mentioned the box of books that you're, as you prepare to go back to school. LS2 Cataloging provides a streamlined import solution that connects directly to Mackin and Children's Plus which, which offers that very streamlined approach for, for loading those vendor records. The ability from circulation is also available to add a, to quickly add a record for an item whenever the system does not contain a record. LS2 cataloging incur, includes searching solutions powered by a modern search engine that enables the teacher librarian to quickly locate school resources. There are spaces to support editing batches of records, to support template workflows, to support the exporting of records, and to hold on to those records 
until you want to place them into the catalog for circulation. A natural language editor minimizes the need to maintain a working knowledge and an ongoing knowledge of data standards. And there's integrations into external services that support the data accuracy and the automated enrichments that I previously mentioned. LS2 cataloging also provides an intuitive user experience Those, and tools to support label printing, where you have, may have to do that original cataloging, or you may have to replace a label. And it provides a streamlined solution to conduct your library's inventory. Before I turn it over to Kim, Oh, I want to, uh, for the demonstration, we have a few questions for you. Rhea? Thanks, Sam. So on your screen shortly, you will see our first poll of two. Um, we want to find out who, who's here today. So your first question is, how does your district catalog new materials? So are you in a district that uses centralized cataloging where maybe there's one team that handles everything? Is it more that each school is responsible for cataloging their own collections? Maybe it's a combination of one and two. Um, or possibly you're getting pre-cataloged records from a vendor and maybe you're not doing a whole lot of cataloging. Um, or maybe you have an option that we haven't thought of, which would be other. And if you do select other, we would love to hear from you. Please go ahead and add some comments into the questions panel um, if you're doing something different than one of those options. And if you're doing something different from, um, or if, if you're uploading records, I should say, from a vendor, we're also curious to know what vendors you're, you're getting records from. So if, if you're not doing that cataloging option, what does that look like as well? So go ahead and drop your, your questions in. Ah, here's the results. Looks like it's about a 30-30 split between centralized and individualized cataloging with a combination. Oh, and a good portion of you are also um, uploading pre-cataloged records. So yeah, I would love to know where you're getting those, those records from, which vendors you're using. All right, we have one more poll that should show up, and this is what your role is going to be in the library system. Um, kind of what department are you coming from? So are you maybe a frontline staff who's working as a school librarian, teacher librarian, or a media specialist? Uh, maybe you're coming from one of those centralized areas and are in library administration, library management. Maybe you're joining us today from your IT or technology department, or perhaps other. There's another option for you out there. So go ahead and let us know. And while you're uh, filling that out, I'll, I'll add some commentary here. I was joking with Kim before the webinar that um, my, my bookcase is not cataloged, which <laughs> it is done by color. And I thought everyone on here would hate that. So thank you all for bearing with me and my, my rainbow books. <laughs> All right, we should have some results. Yep, all right, looks like the majority is library administration and management. So about 44% of you are in that role and 17% of our teacher librarians. We do have a lot of other, I do see some staff on the call. I bet they're all joining as well. So glad to have everybody. And we just wanted to get a sense for how um, everyone's been distributed. So thank you so much, Kim. I'm going to pass it back over to you. And thank you for joining us for Webinar Wednesday. We're looking forward to seeing what you can show us. Thank you, Rhea. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview. It's going to have to be brief. There's so much functionality to talk about that I'm going to have to really kind of just focus on a few areas and um, just give you a good sense of what the application entails. Um, I'm a longtime cataloger, as Rhea mentioned. I love working in LS2 cataloging. You know, I've used MARC for many, many years, but now I, when I'm cataloging for eBibliophile, one of our data services, I always start in LS2 cataloging because it's, I have glossaries at my fingertips. I have all these tools that work for me. So I'm giving you a, he a head start warning that I am somewhat biased, <laughs> but um, anyway, I'll show you what there is to see. So LS2 cataloging. I did want to mention um, as I get going here that the primary focus of all of us as we developed LS2 cataloging and as we continue to expand the functionality is we keep a couple of things in mind. We want to support our customers' user data entry needs. We want to support adding enrichment to titles. We want to su support tools that allow for data consistency. 
It is the enrichment and data consistency that supports our primary mission of a catalog, which is search and discovery, where you want to provide access to all of your materials, to all of your library users. And we keep that in mind continuously as we work, um, work through this. So hopefully you can all see my screen. I'm at LS2 Cataloging. And let me log in here. It's web-based, so it facilitates using a tablet for inventory, for an example. So it's pretty handy. And as I go through this, I am going to breeze somewhat quickly um, because I don't have a lot of time in today's webinar. But I do encourage you, if you're interested in a more detailed workflow demonstration, to reach out to us because we can schedule something to get to answer more of your questions. All right, so this is when you log in, you're brought to the home or the dashboard. There's a couple of uh, things on here that I want to focus first, which is location. Did I mention that there are user permissions and settings? Can't remember if I just talked about that. Yes, I think I did. Sorry, <laughs> got my notes here, but who knows about that. Um, location, very important when you're inside LS2 cataloging because this controls some of the uh, data that you see on display and that you can work with. For example, user permissions, you have to select which locations you're allowed to work with. I am, um, I have, you know, like administrator level access so you can see my full list of uh, locations here in this drop down some users have only access to one or two or five locations and other users only have access to one location and that's what you'll see up here in this upper left corner it's kind of important to know which location you're in if you have multiple locations that you're responsible for and which ones you're not so in other words uh, location limiting is a permission that's going to be across the ILS you cannot see items if you don't have permission for that location. Another thing I wanted to point out is the activity feed here in the center. We keep track of uh, various actions for 180 days. You can filter those results here, which is uh, very helpful. In addition, uh, the one thing I wanted to show is besides all these other options, there's this deleted option filter that you can select. If you accidentally delete a title, which does happen, you can come in here and find it on the activity feed and click recover, and it will bring that title back into an active status. You will have to replace items, but at least you have your title that can be recovered. So that's pretty handy. All right, I'm going to start by focusing on the three workflows to add titles, to load new titles into your database, and I'll start with import. Now, you can start right here with your, if you've been given a vendor record file, you can start right here, but I want to take a slightly different approach to get into import because we have integration with two vendors, Mackin and Children's Plus. If you have an account with those libraries and you place an order for materials, with that integration, the vendor record file will be sent automatically to your database through a service that we provide, and you'll get a notification up here in this little bell behind the bell is the notification section. So when you log in in the morning, you can check your notifications and you'll see a variety of, of notifications that can appear in here. The ones we want to talk about for right now are these four notifications that some files have been received from one from Children's Plus and three from Mackin. So what, it gives a little of information, invoice number, the location, and whether it's physical or electronic. There's some slightly different workflows with you dealing with electronic titles versus physical. And so it's ready for import. So I'm just going to select it. And I'm given a little more information. I'm given the name of the file. Sometimes I believe you receive an email from the vendor that lists a lot of the same information. Um, so we just provide that information for you here. And I click import. So it takes me immediately to the files ready to go. I'm trying to move my screen up. Uh, apparently because I'm sharing, I can't do that. So, okay. Um, we're brought, we've skipped the first step. The first step is simply selecting a file, but it's already here available. So now I'm on step two, and this is where you have to just make some decisions about this vendor file. First of all, think about new titles that are in that file. It could be a mix in that record file of new titles and um, that you've never added to your database before, or there could be a match on an existing title. So first think about a new title with items on this import file. Do you want those items to stay in an in-processing state, or do you want them to be immediately available? 
And the way you think about that is, is the item shelf ready? Do I have a box of books? I have this vendor file. I, they're ready for the shelf. I want to make them available. In processing means you need a little while to get the shelf ready. You might need, a, you don't want them to be immediately available to every user of the ILS because tied in with this status is also the title state. And in LS2 cataloging, we offer two states. One is draft, one is published. The titles can, can sit as a draft in a title space for a long period of time. Whenever you're ready to publish that title, you have time to work on it. So we give you that option that you can choose when to make that title readily available across the ILS. When you publish that title and those items, then that becomes available to all the circulation, the OPAC, the reports, every other application for the ILS sees that data and processes it and makes it readily available, indexes all the data and it's readily available. Until you publish that, that data stays inside LS2 cataloging in the respective title space. So that's just another workflow where you might need to be need some time to work on the records, edit them to your satisfaction, add your items, make sure the items that are already added by import are correct. Now what you want to do when there's a match? So the import process will check. We have seven criteria we use for matching to make sure the match is correct. Do you want to keep the existing content? In that case, the import title, uh, well, if it has items on it, those items will be moved over to the matching title, including replacing on order items if you have an on order. Do you want to replace existing content? Well, in that case, it's going the import title bibliographic data is going to completely replace what's on your matching title. And that might be good when it's a really full record and it's replacing a briefer original record. Um, but you may want to choose that midpoint, sort of a mix, merge selected, where it'll keep most of the bibliographic content that was already there, but you can add or replace subjects or notes from the import title. So you can expand the subjects by adding subjects, or you can replace existing subjects. So that just gives you a, uh, another option. Now, when I choose available, you can't really see the, truck, the record state, but it's switched to published. We assume that if you're making something available, you want everybody in the ILS to see it. So if I choose, I'm going to pick draft here just so I can show you the titles easily enough. You have to select a title space. And I'm going to talk a little more about title spaces in just a moment. You have to select where you want those draft titles to go. These are copies of the MARC record, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, I'll pick uh, import demo. Now, next thing to think about, what do I want to do with those import errors? There will be some import errors. Could be the vendor record is missing a holdings code, a location. Could be missing an item barcode. Maybe the holdings code, the location collection combination they entered was incorrect. It wasn't found. So we need to know what to do with these errors. And they're just sent to a title space for you to deal with. And, you, and I can send them to the same file, the same title space, or I can choose a different one. And on this, for this case, I'll just choose a different one. So let me get to that. Finally, you have these authority control options. And I'm going to talk about this a little further in when, I, when we actually look at a title record. But keep unverified. This is what happens when the authority matching processes. We have integrated authority control in library.solution so that that way your authorized headings are the most accurate they can be. So if it can't find a match with the uh, national authorities and our ITSMARC authorities database or your local authority file that you've already created, what should authority process do? Keep it unverified or verify it locally? The, the difference, the local authority records are created in both cases and you can still work with an unverified authority. It's just a signal to other users because you only see the status of unverified in outside LS2 cataloging, but it's a warning to the user that, well, maybe that name isn't quite right. Maybe that is not the way we like to have our series title. Maybe the uh, punctuation is weird, so we want to change that. So just letting you know that here's this local authority. It may or may not be right for you. Uh, most of our customers choose Verify locally because they don't have staff to work every week on verifying authorities. So there's a report available they can come back later and, and do some authority management as they have time. 
I'm just going to keep it unverified. This database I'm showing you is one of my test databases, and I like to see the unverified so I know what's going on. Next step, locations. This is for title. This side of the screen is for title and title and item ads. And you always have a default location, but you can select any locations you want for the import. We also offer location groups, which is very helpful for digital titles um, as well as regular titles. But it allows you to, so instead of having to select five, six, ten separate locations, you can select a group. This is the group for elementary schools. Maybe I want it to be for the middle schools as well. So I've added more locations with just one click. I don't have to select all these different locations. That's pretty helpful. I'll just go on to it. And then we get a final step to review and we're ready to go. Kind of went into detail there, but import's the pretty most common workflow people use to get their records into um, LS2 cataloging. I should mention that during import, we have a couple of automated processes that occur as the titles are being saved into the database. We have a process, we call it Purify, but it just corrects a lot of the most common mark structural issues. And it also goes through what, uh, what we call RDA Express. It's adding RDA uh, terms and various, um, it, it ex expands abbreviations, for example. It does a various number of processes to bring it up to RDA standards. RDA is the current standard for our cataloging practices. Okay, moving on, I want to show you another way of getting items and titles into your database, and that is fast add. You start from circulation. So let me jump over to my LS2 staff window, and let me bring up a user. So this is a workflow where you are a student or staff person comes up to your desk and wants to check out an item. So you bring up the person, and hang on, I copied the barcode so I wouldn't have to take your precious time and um, scan for it. And there's no nothing found. It would, If it had been found, it would have immediately checked it out to me. Nothing was found. So I want to add a new title. I'm brought over to LS2 cataloging. This is the, where you add titles, title data through LS2 cataloging. If I had not already logged into LS2 cataloging, that would be my first step. It would ask me for my user login. And once here, I want it, it's asking for a standard number. And I copied that, so hang on one second. If I don't have a standard number, I would just type in five or six numbers at random just to get to the next screen. So the first thing it does is the process tries to see if there's a match inside your local database, meaning you've already saved a copy of that title in your database. That's what we call local. And if it finds it, great. If it doesn't find it, then it goes out because we have a subscription to Itzmark Bibliographic Database and it's found a matching record for this title. And so I can publish it right here. So I have a full level record already brought in. I'm not creating a brief record. I'm instead creating a full level record. And I'm sitting here on the item screen so I can quickly add my item. And this is a children's book. Uh, and I could put in my fiction. Let's make up something. Um, everyone has different ways of doing their shelf location. I can add price, all this other information to my item record and save it, and I'm good to go. The title's been published. That means it's available across the ILS. I can jump back to LS2 staff, and I forgot to copy this, so hang on one second, and hopefully this will work. Usually the item barcode is immediately available. It takes a few minutes for the indexes to work. Great. The server is a little slow. But normally you come right back to LS2 staff. That's our circulation module here. You paste in the barcode and it works. I won't take time in case it doesn't decide it's not to work today, but um, yeah, let me just get out of that. But normally that's what you can come right back to. I just tested this yesterday and it worked fine. So there's just something going on with my database today. So I'm ready to go. I can check it out. I'm, I'm all set. And I've added a new title to the database which is available to, the titles are available to everyone if they need it. So that, that worked out really well. Okay, third way to get new titles into the database is through title spaces and item spaces. Mostly title spaces is where I call the matching search. So from, from a title space, this is just a way of, it's a virtual representation of the titles you have maybe on a cart book cart next to your desk. Maybe it's a box of donations that you're working through. Maybe it's a box of vendor-ready 
a shelf ready vendor records that you have and you maybe have imported them as draft and brought them into a title space. Maybe you have done maintenance work on a number of titles and you've brought them into a title space. Um, this is a mix of titles that were previously published as well as new. And so from a title space, you can do a lot of work. Um, this is a standard number. You can search by standard number. We have about 10 standard numbers that we accept. There's also an advanced search where you can type in a title or a name. You can add some additional information to kind of narrow the results. I've pre to save a some few precious minutes, I've already added a standard number here that I want to search for and see what happens. So I'm going to search for the title. When no result appeared immediately, that was an indication that there was either um, more than one result from our auto match process or there was no results. So let me see what happened. There's obviously no results here from local. So I'm going to go out to my its mark and I have three results here. And now I can choose which is the one that suits me the best. We have an uh, action over here called review title. These are the data sets names. If you're an ITSMARC subscriber, you kind of recognize some of these. CONSP stands for Contributed School and Publics. We have nine or 10 libraries now with more to come that are contributing their bibliographic records. I can click on review title. And this gives me a read-only view of the data. I can decide if this looks like a pretty good record, if, if it's got data I can use. Now, you will not see a subdivision on these subjects. You'll just see the main term, but it gives you a good idea of what's here. If I'm not happy with that one, I can go on to the next one. We can see format here. There's a lot of information here to help you narrow down those, the result. And let's take this one instead. I can either select title here. I can also select title here. And now it's in my title space. It's lost in the night. I'm going to open a title here in just a moment to show you, but I wanted to show you two other options for um, getting titles in. One is what we call copy title. Uh, and that's these two that I've already put in here. So if I am cataloging, say, a volume of Naruto, I can't find a record for volume, say, 52, but I want to make a, I can make a copy of an existing record to use as my record. And I can use that for a variety of purposes, but I use it the most often with series titles because sometimes it's hard to find, like especially with manga, it's hard to find graphic novels. It's hard to find one, a series of a particular record for a particular volume. So I like to use copy title. And you can choose to make a copy of it right here. It asks, are you sure? And it will bring in that record and then you just simply edit it and remove all the data that's not relevant to the thing you're cataloging. I'm cataloging volume 52. And I'm going to show you this title screen in more detail in just a moment. But you would go through the record, fix it to make it match what you're cataloging, and just save the draft and back out. And I'll back out. I'm kind of jumping around, I realize. There's another option where you can create a template where, for example, Kindle. This is what I've made as a template here. And I would just want to review title and then copy it. And I have a new version of that record, which I can then edit to make it match what I want. Normally, this is not something I saved, but let me, I normally put something like template in the title so that that way when I see it in my search results, I'll know that that's a template. As long as you do not add an item to it, this template, it will never show up in LS2 pack or OPAC. No one will know about it. And you can simply use it as a template and make it generic so you can uh, add your, the data that you need. And finally, there's an original entry option called create new title. And so I put in the title, can't find it anywhere. I mean, it's pretty weird. <laughs> so I hope no one will find it. Um, now this morning, this went really quickly. So I don't think it's worth checking all my other C3950 options that I have available here. These can be configured for each library. So I'm going to click Create New Title, create my title, select my, I'll make a book out of this, select my format. And now I have a new title that just has my title that I entered as a search term, and I can add every, whatever I need to the rest of the title record. Okay, I know I'm breezing through this very quickly, but 
Now let's take a, a quick look at the actual title editor itself. So I'm given a warning that there's an unverified authority here, but that doesn't stop me from working with this record, with publishing it, with having items on it. And we have a titles tab, an items tab, an e-resource tab, and an enhanced content tab. There's some basic information here at the top of the page, including a reading service that we provide that brings in data from based on your standard number for accelerated reader, AR, and Lexile. And so that will display here, as well as over an LS2 pack. That way you can see it. Then we have a, it's a natural language editor. There's no mark. You don't have to think about mark coding whatsoever. You can just focus on the data itself. We have a variety of titles that can be added. As you can see, we've got a long list of titles. We've got series titles. You can actually work with this authority right here from the screen if you wish. Not all users have permission to verify, but you can always add a new heading even if you don't have permission to verify it. So that way you can add your appropriate data point into your record, whether you have permission or not. You can add contributors. This is for all of the personal names, authors, uh, so personal names, corporate names, meeting names, and it's, it's mark authorities that we're searching here. This, this is free, it's not subscription, it's free, it's part of your software where you can search for a new um, personal name. Uh, pick someone we all know. Oops, that was not what I wanted to click on. I wanted to find the one that's appropriate for us, which is, this is the standard William Shakespeare. If I don't like the um, its mark authority, that's the national level authority records available. I can select local if I have a better local authority I prefer. So that makes it easy on you. If you want to add uh, a role, this is for a relator term, if you know that word, this is the role. So maybe William Shakespeare was an illustrator. I mean, I'm just making this up. <laughs> kind of not, not you know, really very pertinent. And I can select what I need from a glossary. Again, I do not have to go out and look for the list of official roles and relator terms that RDA wants us to use. It's all available in a glossary. I can add as many contributors as I need. Summary notes, genres. If I want to add, this is large print, so I might want to add a large type genre. I can add that. I can add as many genres as I wish using this glossary. We do the work to save this for you um, so that you don't have to maintain your own spreadsheets. You don't have to update it regularly. We update it once a year with all the published vocabularies for all of these genres. Here are all your subjects and their sources. And you can easily change, if you don't like to use the word juvenile fiction, you can easily change that. Hang on, I'm clicking, but apparently I'm not clicking hard enough. We have a glossary for all of these subdivisions as well, so that it makes it a little easy on you. Notes, awards, we have a nice award glossary. If you, want, if you belong to Forest of Reading, which is a Canadian award, we have a lot of state awards we've been adding, as we hear from customers. Characteristics, audience, easily changeable for you if you want to change it to from juvenile to something more specific like pre-adolescent or preschool or primary. You can do that quickly, easily here. We have some other information that goes into these characteristics. Physical description, it's all very easy. You just type in what you need. The back end will do a lot of the punctuation for you. You don't even have to think about that. And of course you add whatever information you need all the way through. Okay, I better hurry up. I'm going slow here. Uh, physical items. You can add items. I just want to point out one nice feature about this is you can easily duplicate. If you receive five copies of a title, you add one, and then you can come in here and add four more easily. You can input, the, scan the barcodes manually. You can generate them automatically because we have a label printing for barcodes option. And you set the circulation status. E-resources, you can add resources for additional information. Enhanced content, this is just a copy of what you will see in LS2 pack. We want it, a lot of catalogers and users of LS2 cataloging want to see what their OPAC users were going to see. Okay, I, I'm, I'm trying to hurry now. So we got to talk about item spaces. Batch edits, I haven't really talked about batch edits. We can do that from a title space as well as an item space. So I'm in an item space now, and these are all the list of items that I've put in my space. 
typically users put items in an item space for batch edits or for just individually editing each title. Let me show you the items edit, items batch edit. I forgot to show you the title batch edit available, and I will do that in just a moment. The nice thing about this is if you're doing genrefication, you can add a prefix to your existing fantasy, existing shelf location, which has the author specific information or the um, Dewey number, whatever classification you're using. And this adds a prefix to your existing shelf location so that then you can um, uh, save all of them. They all get saved and as you run through it and you can review it, by, you can move them to a different item space for that purpose. So that's very handy to do that. Of course, from here, you can also, and I forgot to point this out, you can export titles with these items on it if you need that. You can send all of the labels to the label queue or you can print them immediately. So you have some options there. Forgot to point out title space, batch actions, and you have some of the same options. You can do a batch edit. Let me just show genre in case you're doing genrefication. You can search from a glossary so you don't have to remember how to spell it. And you can have it sent to draft or published as you wish. Okay, advanced search is the final thing I want to talk about. And we have this local search box up here in the upper right along with advanced. And let me get my example here. I already remember this one. You can scan your item barcode or you could just search. These are previously published titles. You can only find published titles using these two options. You cannot go out to its mark or Z3950 to find titles. This is only looking for your published titles, not the drafts that are in a title space. And so then I can easily find my results here. I can open the title, do what I need to do. If I want to just add an item, I can do that. I don't have to republish the title. I can just simply add an item. Items are saved separately from titles, which has a lot of advantages for the, for the user. Advanced search. Lots of different ways you can bring up data and you can filter it by various means. Um, let's see, I could bring up, uh, it's pretty powerful and it gives you fantasy as a subject and I wanna add a parameter for uh, holdings code, children's fiction. So I have 94 items in my database that are that have the word fantasy as a subject and are in my particular collection of juvenile fiction. And now I can do things with them. I can select all of them and send all of my items to an item space that I've selected. I could also select all 94 and send them to an item space if I want to do something to all the shelf locations, reprint labels, print barcode labels, whatever I need to do, or I can export them if I need to send that file off somewhere. Okay, I know I breezed through quite a bit. Um, I have just a couple more things to mention in passing. Up here, I'll just start on the left side and go across. Here's our help. We have a very good help document, lots of screenshots, lots of information. We also have on our customer-facing library.solution, um, customer-facing website, LS Community, we have a lot of resources there as well. Here's where you can get to your label printing options. For labels, I have a label queue here and I have a barcode queue here. And so then I would be selecting my labels and printing them from here. We also have an archive. So after you've printed something, in case your printer jams, <laughs> which happens quite a bit, you can come in here and actually reprint that same job. And so that way you don't have to rebuild that label queue all over again. Notifications I did show you. We have inventory right here. I just have one showing right now, but it's very user-friendly, very easy to have multiple people working on one collection at a time. It works very well. Uh, let's see, import I showed you. Here's our just quickly unverified authorities in case you decide to take that route. You can work on them. You can also search for any authority to, to, to manage them, to correct them, make corrections. You can also create a local authority whenever you need to. Okay, I think that was very fast. I realized that was extremely fast. Let me go back to the next screen, back to my slide deck. Here's a lot more information on this, using this link. It's our LS2 cataloging page.
page on the co on our uh, corporate website, which has a lot of information about it. There's also a link there if you need more information. All right, Ria, I'm done. Thanks, Kim. No, you did great. That was very informative. As a novice myself, I was following along and felt like, you know what, I might be able to do this. Not not today, but one day. Okay. Early, on to at least me personally. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in so far. And for those of you who just now thought of your question, go ahead and get those added in. And while those are coming in, we do have one last poll that we want to share with everybody. So that'll be on your screen shortly. And this is whether or not you would like more information. As Kim said, she, she did go quickly and there's a lot to touch on. So if you feel like you would like to learn more, if you would like to, us for, to do another webinar, or if you would like to schedule time with one of our team members to walk through LS2 cataloging, please hit that yes button on this, this survey, and we will be sure to reach out following our webinar. So we're going to leave this up for just a little bit, and I'm going to start going through some of these questions that have come in. Um, the first question is, this came up, Kim, when you were um, uh, changing some of these subject headings, and it is, can you change the label of the subject heading? So for instance, if I want to switch juvenile to young readers, is there a way to actually change that in the catalog? As a, as a subject subdivision, is that is that kind of where I was showing? Yeah, that. and I think this is going one step further as well. So not just going into the subdivision, but maybe changing the, the labels. Oh. Not the actual subject in the title record, but a label like a like a label like yeah. a spine label, pocket label, part of your shelf location. I think this is um, looking at subject headings specifically. Like we've seen this, for instance, in um, in some uh, libraries that are looking to change, um, for instance, um, unverified alien or uh, illegal uh, yes. alien, I believe, yes. over to yeah. maybe a, a more uh, friendly yes. terminology. And I think some as well prefer things like juvenile to switch to a few other things. So if, if you have an example of that that you can show, that would be great. Yes, I can. Do I, I, am I sharing now? Am I back on? Is, yep, is our poll has gone away. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me get, uh, we are, development has not yet occurred to add a completely new subject. I'm just going into edit. This is title, batch edit. Uh, so from a batch edit perspective, you do have options for subjects. We will be, um, development is being discussed and sort of planned for part of our, we're trying to support critical cataloging projects. So we know that we need to add a batch edit to add a completely new subject. That's our first phase where we'll be adding. So this is where you can select, uh, but this particular add batch edit only adds a subdivision. So it's looking for a particular subject uh, like this. I'll pick that one for random. But you can then add a subject like uh, fiction um, that maybe it was missing before. So I don't know if that quite is what you mean. I think you're probably referring to adding an entire new subject. That's not yet here, but that's certainly something we're planning to do. Yeah. because we want to support critical cataloging. From the actual title record, let me go back into one of these. You can always yeah. add a entirely new subject manually as you open a title, easy to do. Um, we do uh, let me think, what, what is one of the ones for critical cataloging? And I should know this. Is it, um, ah, this is embarrassing when I just, I just saw that I'm working on a spreadsheet trying to capture some of the terms. I'll just- And I put you on the spot too. <laughs> Is illegal alien the word? Is that the one that they're taking now instead? It's not, um, Library of Congress has approved it, but that's not yet available. I'll just pick illegal immigration, but I can always add something to this record if I need to. Uh, that's not quite the right word that I'm thinking of. I thought, the, I thought else Library of Congress had improved us. You can always add something manually here at any point. And if you don't find what you need, you can always create a new, let me just take that. I don't think it's a legal alien, but it looks like we created this at some point in our local authority. This is a local authority for that. So I can choose, the, I can make one up. I can add whatever headings I need to as treat them as in a local authority. And these are available for, for anybody in the system to, to use because it's a system-wide thing. And then I can add whatever I need to over here. Um, I don't think, I don't know, fiction would actually combine with maybe pictorial works or something. 
Yeah. So there is the option to, yeah. to go in and make some changes. And it sounds like there's going to be more development coming soon that will, yes. will help with and that as well. With these glossaries, we know we don't have every term possible that people use for glossaries. So we update them uh, whenever we have customers just tell us what they want and we update them and add them wherever possible. Perfect. Um, we yeah, do have we have um, a few more questions as well. Okay. If, if you don't mind if I jump to the next one. Sure, um, I answered that one okay. <laughs> yes, sounds good. I, the next one is, um, why is large print a genre? Should it not be a format of the physical item? I believe this is when you were in the title spaces. Uh, okay, it is a format. Well, it's, it's both. It's all three. Th it's actually, people put it in all three places. Um, I hear this when you trap a tiger. This is the, uh, the format here. This is based on the mark format. So when I open this title, it's showing large print. But what I've noticed over the years, technically library, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, Library of Congress stopped using it. They were putting a subject in called large type books as a topical subject. But it's, it's, this is not really, this book is not about large type books. It's, it is a large type book, which is a form, a form of work. So, but I've seen people, this is a Library of Congress record and they're still doing this. They're still putting large type books in. But then I also have seen them, and that's why I do, I personally add them as a large um, type, as a genre. That way it shows up in a couple of different ways. Um, I'm waiting for someone, a customer to say, just make it large print and start a large type. But at any point, there's also a form of work down here. I don't know if large print, large print is also available here. These characteristics, in case you want to know about RDA, these characteristics uh, contain controlled vocabularies for that are RDA compliant. And so it, there's good. It's actually very good for search and discovery to have this word large print available in multiple places in the title record. So it's actually very good to have it as a characteristic, a form that goes happens to go in the 380 field. In case in case you want to know, um, it can be in a note, it can be in a topical subject, it can be in a genre. So that way the relevancy is improved in, in search and discovery. <laughs> Long-winded answer. When you ask me a question, I give you lots of information. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love inviting you to our webinar series. You give us great info. Um, I do have one more question that has come in. Where do I check in cataloging to see if we have Con SP installed? that it's not uh, contributed data set. Okay, let's see. Well, if you first of all, you have to be a subscriber to its mark, uh, the bibliographic databases. If you are already using, um, the easiest way is pre through preferences, which I haven't even shown, you'd have to be, uh, it's gonna come back automatically by use when you search for a title from its mark, but it's actually configured over here in LS2 preferences. I don't know if you want to, Get into that. Maybe support support can certainly help you find it. It's under um, search profiles. It's Mark. So it's under system settings search pro. And then you look and can see if you're if you are a subscriber to It's Mark, you'll see all of the data sets listed here. And here's where you can move them to be higher up in the in the result list. This has just happened to be the way they sort through as they're searching. And you can put the ones that you like the best closer to the top, but they will bring results from all of them. I don't know if that helped. Of course, you can certainly contact your inside sales representative. You can mm -hmm. um, contact support, TLC support, if you're one of our customers to know. Anybody, you don't have to be a library solution customer to access ITSMARC. There's a website for ITSMARC, ITSMARC.com, where you can. Um, if you're, once you're a subscriber and they have offer free trials, once you're a subscriber, you can access those record title records there and download them and then import them into your ILS. We just haven't integrated with LS2 cataloging so that when you're searching, uh, let me go back to where I was searching before, but I can go back. Yeah, and for those of you who are looking for more information on that, that's one of our handouts. So double check the one that says TLC data services. It does talk about its mark. It also talks about eBibliophile as well as RDA Express, which Kim mentioned earlier for those, um, for RDAifying the collection. Yeah, so this okay. just tells you the data set. So you just know ahead of time what you're getting, but you have to be a subscriber first. 
but that's certainly something to talk to the sales, your sales rep. If you're a LS customer already, just talk to your sales representative, Valencia. Yes, and you should all receive an email from us tomorrow um, reminding you about the webinar uh, as a follow-up and you can respond to that email as well and we'll receive that too. All right, that is all of our questions. Sam, Kim, anything else to add before we move into our next slide? Oops, I already did, sorry. Thank you everyone for attending. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions. Perfect. And it looks like the person who did ask about the Con SP has it in their list. So we've, we've already solved a problem today. Okay, good. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, a few reminders for everybody. Um, this is a back to school series. So part two is coming next week. We are gonna be covering more of LS2 staff as well as the OPAC. So please be sure to come back uh, next week. And then Kim also mentioned that we have a new LS community site that's devoted to schools. So for our current customers who are interested, uh, be sure to check that out. It's available at lscommunity.tlcdelivers.com. Um, you would log in like normal, and then the URL for that is slash schools at the end. There should also be a link right on that homepage as a banner. So be sure to check that out. And that link is also listed in one of our handouts. So be sure to download the LS community one as well. Um, so lots of great handouts, lots of great information. This is your reminder to download all of the goodies because when we close this out, they're gone. So grab them now. Um, and then a few other reminders is that for our current customers, TLCU, our annual user conference is happening November 1st through the 3rd and registration is live. We are also planning on releasing the schedule this week if we haven't sent that out during this webinar. So be sure to watch for that and get registered if you haven't. You can do so at tlcu.live. So check that out. And then the other thing is we will be sending out a survey following this webinar that includes um, information about what webinars you would like to see. So if there is a lot of great information here and you want Kim to talk about title spaces all day long, <laughs> you let us know in that survey and we'll put together a webinar based around that specific topic. So we want to hear from you all. And of course, reach out to us anytime at info at tlcdelivers.com. Again, you'll get emails from us. Um, probably the email that reminded you to show up today, it's the same email address so you can respond to us. And be sure to check us out next week. The website is on your screen, tlcdelivers.com slash webinars. So that's what we have for you today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Kim. Thank you both so much for joining us on Webinar Wednesday. And thank you to you all for joining us on this afternoon. And and um, we hope to see you next time. So, happy cataloging in the meantime. <laughs> Bye. Bye.